Well, what uh, I'd like to do today is, uh, is talk about tipping points in a somewhat broader context. And the major point that I'd like to make is we're standing uh, before an enormous revolution in healthcare, and it's a revolution that very much is going to be driven by wellness, ironically enough. And I'll explain uh, exactly what I mean by that. <laughs> I'll be talking about a couple of companies uh, throughout the context of uh, this discussion. And I wanted to make a conflict of interest statement. Now, with regard to tipping points, I'm going to talk about tipping points in a, in a broader context than we've seen today. And I would say they fall into three categories. One is changes in state and biological systems, and we'll talk about some examples of that. I would say two are really paradigm changes in how we view or how we practice biology. And three, there's one really interesting organizational financial change that uh, opened up enormous interesting possibilities for ISB, and I'll talk about that as well. When uh, I started as a young assistant professor in 1970 at uh, Caltech, the issue I really worried about was the enormous complexity of biology and of disease. And I didn't see any way whatsoever that the classic tools of molecular biology could even touch that uh, complexity. And it reminded me very much of the parable of the elephant and the six blind men. And each feeling a different part of the elephant said the elephant is a spear or a rope or a a fan, and, and the real idea is that you need a conceptual framework for thinking about complexity, and that later turned out to be systems biology. But equally, you need tools and strategies for dealing with complexity, and we'll talk about uh, some of those that, uh, that I've participated in. So I'm gonna go through and talk about 10 tipping points uh, in, in uh, medicine, biology and medicine. And the 10th one will be what I think is really going to uh, transform uh, healthcare. So uh, early in my career, I was involved in developing a lot of uh, high throughput instrumentation for reading and writing DNA. And the essence of what that did was introduced high throughput biology uh, 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 and gave it the ability to acquire uh, big data, and it really, in some ways, began pushing the digitalization of biology and medicine that we'll talk more about later. One of those instruments, the automated sequencer, got me involved in the Human Genome Project. And uh, starting in 85 and struggling for five years against the uh, highly conservative community of biologists, including NIH, fighting it all the way, uh, the Genome Project did come into being, and of course, what it did from, from my point of view is it gave us a complete parts list for genes and by inference proteins, and that was what was necessary for beginning to take uh, a systems approach to uh, complexity in, in living organisms. Developing the automated sequencer really required putting together a lot of talents, engineering, uh, chemistry, computer science, sophisticated molecular biology, and there I realized that this idea of cross-disciplinary biology was absolutely critical to integrating leading-edge biology to push the development of the technologies it needed and in correspondence with the right types of analytic tools and so forth. And I actually moved to Seattle in 1992 uh, thanks to Bill Gates, who made it possible to set up the first cross-disciplinary department. And it was enormously <coughs> successful. It did a whole variety of things that we won't talk about. But one of the things it did was set a framework for then thinking about how to create an institute for systems biology. And in 2000, I actually resigned from the university. And a lot of it had to do with um, state university bureaucracies and their inability to deal with new ways of doing things and started the institute and it really pioneered this holistic systems approach to, uh, to biology. And of course, we started looking at the very beginning 
uh, at systems approaches to disease. Uh, and that, of course, led to this idea of systems medicine and a P4 medicine, which I'll uh, describe a little bit later. I would say the essence of, uh, of systems medicine is threefold. One, it's this idea that a major way you can deal with complexity is to acquire for each individual an enormous dynamical data cloud that assesses the genomic as well as the environmental uh, contributions to disease of many, many different types of data. And the idea is once you'd acquired billions of data points in this virtual cloud, you would have the tools to integrate and model for each individual these data to identify actionable possibilities that could either improve wellness or ameliorate and or avoid uh, disease. What I will emphasize about big data, and it's really critical, is big data and machine learning go nowhere without domain expertise in biology. And I think that's the reason that the Googles and Microsofts have failed again and again in trying to do something significant in healthcare. They have the computational power and they can get the data, but they don't quite know where to go. And we all know that signal to noise is a real problem in these issues. And of course, one of the ways to reduce the data dimensionality that we deal with here is to convert it into uh, one of five or six or seven different kinds of uh, biological networks. And of course, these networks mediate uh, the information of uh, development, physiology, aging, but when disease perturbed, they also mediate disease. And if you can capture the essence of the disease perturbed nature of networks, you can come to understand in a deep way disease mechanisms uh, and even begin thinking about early diagnostics and therapeutics. And we'll talk about some examples of that. And the third thing is how we think about data in systems medicine. So one, you want to make the data as global as possible because you don't ever know which elements are really going to be key. And we can do that for genomics. It's harder to do it for most other kinds of data. Number two, I think uh, uh, dynamics is absolutely critical for dealing with signal to noise. And in living organisms, we have two types of dynamics, temporal, and we can kind of do temporal and spatial and we really struggle with spatial dynamics and there are new tools that I think are going to change that. Integrating the data I've uh, talked about uh, to end up with models. And again, I just want to say that uh, in my view, there are two types of noise in these enormous data sets. So one is technical. It has to do with how you gather the data and whatnot. But the second type is biological noise. That is, it is irrelevant biologies whose changes you want to subtract away from the disease biology you're interested in. To do that takes doma deep domain expertise. And if you can't do it, your signal is buried in noise. So um, a uh, sixth uh, uh, tipping point that, that I've been fascinated by is in <coughs> 1987, I got to know the Minister of Finance for the state of Luxembourg, and he was in the process of deciding to diversify Luxembourg's economy away from a 90% dependence on financial services. So he made a proposition to us to write a proposal to help them do that. We did that. We did a whole bunch of things for Luxembourg I won't talk about. But what we asked in return was for $100 million over five years to invent the technologies and strategies of P4 medicine. And with that flexible money and with the magnitude of that money, we were able to take on high risk, high gain uh, strategies. And, and many of them were successful. And we ended up developing uh, a series of nine or 10 uh, emergent technologies and, and new systems-driven kind of uh, strategies. 
and I'll talk about each of those in turn. So emerging technologies, I'm just going to run through and give you some of the ones that I think are really key uh, for the future. And one, uh, oddly enough, is, uh, is DNA sequencing, but it's third generation DNA sequencing. And I'll, I'll talk about a company that spun out of Intel that is here at ISB. We don't really have anything to do with it, but they have, and they may not be the one that wins the race of third generation sequencing, but I'll tell you what their strategy is and in principle what they'll be able to do because it is incredible. So the idea for third generation sequencing is single molecule sequencing, it's electronic detection. That's great because fluorescent detection has a two to one signal uh, to, to noise and electronic has 101. So it's enormously beneficial. And, uh, and the use of nanopores or nanochannels. And what this company at Intel developed was the ability to put two plastics together in such a way that you can create precisely sized pores and you can parallelize that process as large as you want to make it. And what they've developed is the ability then to park a nuclease on the lip of such a pore, capture a strand of DNA, and then cleave off the individual nucleotides and send them through the pore. They've shown that they can distinguish the four bases in uh, such a process. And of course, what's really exciting is uh, uh, nucleases are enormously processive, so it means you can think about uh, uh, 100 KB reads. And of course, for those of who are, uh, us who are interested in genomes, that means de novo assembly and being able to get the gaps that we miss now with the uh, short uh, sequence reads and, and so forth. But the other advantage of this system are one, you have nucleases for RNA as well as DNA, so you can sequence RNA about as easily as you can sequence DNA. And number two, as you clip the nucleotides off, they detect the electric signature, electronic signature of each nucleotide. And of course, there are 16 epigenetic marks on DNA that each will have a unique signature. And in principle, you ought to be able to read as you sequence the epigenetic modifications of the DNA as well. And of course, the final point is, by parallelizing the pores, you can get human genomes sequenced in 15 minutes. And my guess is in five to eight year period, we'll be thinking about a $100 genome. And if you can think about a $100 genome, you can do all sorts of things we don't even consider today just because of the expense. So that's one technology. A second technology has been pioneered by Rob Moritz, who uh, chaired the last session. And he is really pushing a new type of mass spectrometry called SWATH. And I'm not going to go in and talk about it at all. But what it can do is capture electronic signatures of enormously complex mixtures in such a way that you can really consider quantifying uh, five to 10,000 different proteins. So you can begin to make proteomics as global as genomics has been in the past. And of course, a different modification is targeted mass spectrometry. And there, uh, the advantage is you can use an instrument called the triple quadrupole, and you can set up uh, assays for each of 100 or so proteins that will let you quantify them in about an hour. And it's this targeted mass spectrometry we use later for the, um, the diagnostic markers in the blood that I'll actually talk about. And a final uh, area that uh, I'll mention just briefly, and it's something that Jim Heath, who you heard yesterday, has really pioneered. And that's the ability to use circular 5 mer de amino acid peptides as the basic units for constructing protein capture agents <coughs> that are totally equivalent to monoclonal antibodies, but in principle much better. 
They're stable. You can eliminate cross-reactivity. And again, you can parallelize the process. And you can use it to drive protein capture agents for things that antibodies have never been able to make antibodies for. So I think it's in, in a 10 to 15 year period, we'll be using those for our uh, miniaturization of ELISA assays using microfluidics and so forth. And then I'll show you just a very brief example of single cell uh, uh, highly mu multiplexed omic and phenotypic analyses, although we're just going to be looking at, uh, at uh, transcript analyses. So uh, Rushi and Kelly and Martin have really pioneered this. And what we're going to talk about is an initial investigation where we look at the development of iPS cells into cardiomyocytes, and I'm only going to show you the urgest, earliest stage of that uh, developmental process. And the idea, of course, is that when you start with stem cells on day one and give them the growth factor triggers that mediate the differentiation process, you do exactly what we've heard about throughout this whole process. That is, you move them into a state where on the one hand, some of them can go to become uh, cardiac uh, endodermal cells, and on the other hand, they can become cardiac mesodermal cells. And indeed, on this side, they will go and create a whole series of different uh, mesodermal cells. And the question is, can we follow this process through using the criteria that we've talked about in this process to see this tipping point and the emergence of uh, differing classes of, of uh, cell types. And there are two criteria by which you can see these tipping points, uh, increased cell-cell variability uh, and increased coordination of genes. And on the top is the cell-cell uh, variability. And what you can see is a very tight correlation factor for the iPS cells at day zero that begins to broaden to uh, 0.5 and 4 and uh, even beyond that. But at the same time, you can begin to see it gets heterogeneous in the shoulder, and finally it breaks into the two, uh, two types of cardio, cardiac endothelial cells, cardiac mesothelial cells. And of course, with regard to an increased coordination of genes, when you do a plot, you can see at the earliest stages, day zero, there isn't much coordination of gene expression. But as you move to day one and to day two and to day three, you can see that the coordination, which is the blue here, and the anti-coordination, which in a sense is coordination, which is the yellow and red, really so show the second signal feature in this whole process. And of course, we're in a place then to be able to link the potential landscapes to gene regulatory networks to begin thinking about bifurcation parameters and many of the other kinds of things that you've talked about. I'm excited about the idea that we can use this beautifully to define quantized or discrete cell populations whose um, emergence then has to be explained by these tipping point kinds of principles. So we have a whole series of systems-driven strategies for dealing with complexity. That's the eighth point. One is looking at the dynamics of disease, starting at the very point of initiation and being able to follow it through in terms of network behavior. A second is using family genome sequencing to identify disease genes. And then turning blood as a window to distinguish health from disease. And I'm going to talk about uh, each of these three things. We've got lots of ways for stratifying disease, stratifying patients. Where we, uh, Nitin, Baliga, and others are pioneering computational approaches to drug reuse and drug target discovery. And then, as a very last item, we'll talk about high dimensional data clouds. Uh, in, a, in accordance with what I talked about earlier in, uh, in systems medicine. So let's talk about, first of all, the dynamic approaches to studying neurodegeneration that's been induced by prions. And George Carlson at the McLaughlin Institute really uh, was the pioneer in 
creating the um, biological strains that made it possible to separate signal from noise. And I'll show you exactly what I mean uh, by that. So what we did was to inject activated prions into the thalamus of the brain and follow them across, in the case of C57 black, uh, 22 days of, uh, of uh, disease progression, subtracting at 10 different time points the transcriptome of a normal mouse to get genes that were differentially expressed. And of course, to our horror, we saw that roughly a third of the mouse genes were differentially expressed. So there's enormous biological noise there. So what George did was to construct six inbred strain, prion strains of mice that allowed us to subtract away major types of, of, uh, of biological noise. And we ended up with 300 differentially expressed genes that we felt encoded the neurodegenerative response. By following the histopathology in the brain of these animals, we showed that there were four major processes that were working, uh, prion replication, accumulation, glial activation in two forms of neurodegeneration. Each of these had uh, protein interaction networks and transcriptional networks. And we were able then to map the uh, 300 genes into those uh, protein interaction networks. And what we found were two really interesting things. First, that the four major networks were sequentially disease perturbed, starting with the most unique network and then going to uh, innate immune activation and then two forms of neurodegeneration. And the importance of this sequential uh, activation of disease perturbed networks is if you want to abrogate the disease early on, you have to focus on its initial uh, formulation, initial tipping point, and, 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 uh, and see if you can uh, abrogate it at that particular point. What was also striking about this study, though, is only 100, uh, only 200 of the 300 genes mapped into those four major networks, and the other 100 defined six additional networks. And when you collectively looked at the dynamics of each of the 10 networks, they explain virtually every aspect of the pathophysiology of the disease. So the network was a terrific uh, proxy for uh, basic mechanisms and so forth, except for the very earliest stages. And that's something uh, we can talk about how we're dealing with that at this point in time. I will say we've looked at two other uh, degenerative diseases in exactly the same way. We actually have a good model for PTSD that we've really made some interesting discoveries in, and liver toxicity, and four different models of glioblastoma. And in each case, they mimic in striking ways their human counterparts and give us uh, corresponding insights into those fundamental diseases. But one more thing we could do with the prion networks and so forth was to use the uh, fact that you can do a deep transcriptome analysis <coughs> excuse me, of 50 organs in human and mice to a first approximation asking for each organ which transcripts are relatively organ specific. And once you identify them, you can use targeted mass spectrometry to see whether you can identify those uh, organ-specific transcripts as proteins in the blood. And when we did that in humans, we found about 200 brain-specific blood proteins. And for mice, we found roughly 100 or so. And we were able to take 15 of the mouse brain-specific blood proteins that fell pretty evenly into these four major networks and to use those as diagnostic markers to show two important things. One, we could show in the blood that we could detect change, disease changes almost at the same time the networks changed in the brain. So there was a really beautiful correspondence between blood and brain. And number two, we showed that the four networks were indeed sequentially activated as we saw from the network behavior in the blood 
in that when a cognate network for a given protein became disease perturbed, it changes the level of the protein expressed. You can see that in the blood. So we were able then to, uh, to use these kinds of principles to look at human lung cancer. And we developed a panel of 13 human blood proteins that give us the ability to distinguish uh, about 40% of the benign nodules from their neoplastic counterpart. And you can prevent those people from going to surgery, and you can save the healthcare system. $3.5 billion a year, so diagnostics. This diagnostic panel has been accepted with enormous alacrity. And what's really amazing is 12 out of the 13 proteins map into three of the major networks that are seen in lung cancer. So it means in this, we haven't done it, but we will be able to follow uh, progression and, and uh, uh, the earliest stages of the changes and so forth. And of course, the response to therapy. And finally, we've used a similar strategy to look at 66 soldiers, half of which uh, were normal when they came back from Afghanistan, half of which had extreme forms of PTSD. And here we used a mixed panel of microRNAs and protein to get very high sensitivity and specificity for being able to distinguish normal from PTSD soldiers. And of course, the, what is important about this is this is a disease that only heretofore had been neuropsychologically diagnosed. So we can quantify neuropsychiatric diagnoses. And we'll talk about that when we talk about wellness a little bit later on. So we think, in general, with these panels, we can distinguish normal from disease. We can look at early diagnosis follow the progression, follow the response to therapy. We can, in some cases, identify the disease-perturbed networks. And of course, we can stratify disease into distinct subgroups. So these are very, very powerful approaches. And then the last technique I'll talk about is family genome sequencing, where we integrate genetics with genomics. And uh, Jared Roach and Gustavo Glusman have been real pioneers in doing this for us. And I'll talk about a result Seth uh, Ahmet got on uh, bipolar disease at the end. So we initially looked at a family from Utah that had normal parents and two kids, each of which had two different genetic diseases. We sequenced the genomes of all four. And it gave us really a remarkable ability to, one, correct sequencing errors, two, identify rare variants. If two or more members of the family has the rare variant. It's not a sequencing error. You can determine chromosomal haplotypes, and that enormously reduces the chromosomal search space within which you must search for disease genes. And we actually could determine the intergenerational mutation rate of kids, uh, 35 mutations. So there's no such thing as an identical twin. Uh, question is where the mutations are, of course. And we found in this particular case that we reduced the candidate genes to four, and it was simple to make the corresponding assignments. So, uh, uh, so uh, our colleagues have then created a whole series of software programs that let us do all sorts of things that you'd like to be able to do for genomics. And indeed, the family genomics group in the last few years has studied wellness from a number of different angles has studied many different types of diseases, uh, and has uh, developed the software platforms that we talked about. And uh, uh, Gustavo has been a real pioneer in analyzing human genomes and everything. Uh, and the other thing is, together, collectively, we've sequenced since uh, 2009 or 10 about 6,000 human genomes. So we've got an enormous standard that we'll use later in an interesting way. So bipolar disease, uh, what we did was to look at 41 pedigrees with multiple affected bipolars. And we analyzed uh, about 200 individuals from those and a similar number from control pedigrees. And what we found was that there were a whole series of genes that were enormously overrepresented in 
the diseased individuals as compared with their normal counterparts. So what we did was to go out and look at 3,000 sporadics for bipolar disease, and we more or less confirmed these statistics in a very nice way. And it turns out that these genes fall into either GABA signaling pathways or uh, ion channel uh, networks. And it turns out that most people that have bipolar disease have multiple affected genes. So it's a really interesting observation. And even more than that, one of the genes for which we had 13 independent families give us mutations demonstrated that 12 out of 13 of the mutations fell either in the 5 prime end, presumably a controlling region, or a 3 prime end, only one was in the coding region. So those of you who are doing exon sequencing are going to miss an awful lot of regulatory genes uh, in the future. OK, so that's technologies, that's uh, uh, strategies, and so forth. Now I'm going to talk about this, this ninth tipping point, which are th these convergence that lead to a medicine that's predictive, preventive, personalized, and uh, participatory. And the convergences are systems medicine, obviously, uh, the digital revolution and big data, and of course, uh, consumer-driven social networks. And we'll uh, talk about it will become obvious why each of those is incredibly important. And let me just say, the first three Ps, I think, are self-evident. What is really critical about the fourth P, participatory, is the essence of it means that the individual will be at the center of their own health care and will be making their own decisions about how their health care uh, is to be regulated. So P4 medicine differs from contemporary medicine in a lot of ways. It's proactive, not reactive. It's all about dealing with individuals rather than populations. Uh, it's, um, it's all about focusing a major effort on wellness and not just disease. It's about creating these data clouds, dynamic data clouds that we talked about earlier. And it is skeptical of how we do clinical trials now where you take 30,000 patients and you give them drug or placebo, you record the results, and you make inferences about the average population or maybe about whether the drug worked. And each individual is unique genetically and unique environmentally, and they have no business averaging them. So for P4 medicine, you do each individual in the context of themselves, and you aggregate after you have 10,000 individuals into groups that are in accordance with what you're interested in. And of course, the patient consumer activated social networks, I think are really key. One, for educating individuals about this new medicine. Two, for crowdsourcing. And, and three, I think they'll become the advocates for uh, forcing change on a very, very conservative healthcare system. So P4 medicine, in the end, is really about two things. One, it's about quantifying wellness and understanding it. It's about uh, demystifying disease. And of course, society now spends about 98% of its resources on disease. It almost ignores wellness. And in fact, wellness has a bad reputation because there hasn't been very much science done on wellness. And that obviously has to change. We're excited by the fact we think we can really quantify wellness, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on. What is clear to me is in the future, we're going to see the emergence of two separate industries. I think the wellness industry will be quite distinct from the disease or current healthcare industry. And my guess is the market cap for the wellness industry will far exceed the disease industry in the next 10 to 15 years or so. And of course, what's exciting about that is with the emergence of a new industry, we're beginning to create the companies that could be the Googles and Microsofts of wellness, uh, obviously, in the future. The other point that I'll make, again, and I'll <coughs> emphasize this repeatedly, 
is wellness is really the key not only to optimizing human capital by improving your wellness, but it's the key to understanding disease because it's only through wellness to disease transitions at the earliest point we can identify the location of where we should attack disease and revert individuals back to normal. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about wellness to disease transitions uh, in, in the future. And here's really an interesting statistic. If we keep on uh, increasing in our average lifespan, you can make the prediction that half the kids born today will live to be 100 years of age. And the really important question is, what will be the quality of their life for the last 30 or 40 years? And who wants to live if you don't have a mind and you can't do a lot of the things that you'd really like to do? So the final point is this idea of we, we proposed in uh, 2013 of a pilot program to bring P4 medicine to the healthcare system through a longitudinal, multidimensional, and dynamic generation of personalized data clouds for 100,000 well people uh, over a 20-year period. And of course, to get started, last year in March, we began a pilot project of roughly uh, 100 persons to do exactly this kind of project. And I do want to emphasize that Nathan Price has been my uh, co-PI and colleague on all of this, but it's taken a real team to do this. We do whole genome sequencing. We do every three months uh, blood, urine, uh, saliva samples. Uh, so that includes clinical chemistries, 700 metabolites, 400 blood proteins. We do the gut microbiome every three months and then uh, self-tracking uh, lifestyle and monitoring. And the idea, of course, for each individual is to integrate this together, as I said earlier, so as to reveal actionable possibilities that allow you to improve your wellness and or uh, avoid disease. And of course, if you start with a large population like this, you'll see at a given point in time that really is diverged into those who remain well or even increase in their wellness. And it's those who are interesting from the point of view of identifying metrics that will allow us to measure wellness. What was interesting about the 107 individuals is all of them thought they were well. But you can imagine that next to you is a little wellness well. And for most of us, we reside pretty close to the bottom of that well. And it's these actionable possibilities that can bring you up uh, to achieve your uh, potential. And that's certainly, you need metrics to be able to make those assessments and do that. What we can also do on the disease transition thing is follow back the disease transition to a point where the tipping point where things began and started. And of course, we can use some of the techniques we talked to look at networks, to look at single cells, to see these kind of transitions, to get the appropriate kind of signals, both to create diagnost early diagnostic tools and even the therapeutic tools to bring people from the disease back to the wellness trajectory and saving society all of the downstream uh, costs. What is really key about this project is we used coaches to bring the actionable recommendations to the individuals, both to explain them and to integrate persuasively those actionable possibilities into their own healthcare wishes. And our coaches were remarkably uh, effective in doing this, and we had more than a 70% compliance with these actionable possibilities, which I think is, is really uh, quite remarkable. So the coaches really are a key part of this whole process. Um, the study included uh, 107 individuals. It began in March. It used uh, all of the, it generated all of the data tops, types that we've talked about. And let me, let me give you some of the uh, stories. First of all, there are really four kinds of transitions that we're interested in. Less to more wellness and more to less wellness. Uh, 
uh, wellness to disease and the inverse, disease to wellness. And in each of these, you can have interesting tipping points and signatures, all the things that you'd like to be able to see. In the very first clinical study we did in the, did in the first draw, 91% of the individuals had nu nutrient abnormalities. Almost 70% had inflammatory react reactions that were excessive, and we had almost 60% with cardiovascular complications and a lot of individuals that had prediabetes and so forth. So uh, some of these things were very straightforward to deal with, like the nutrition. Uh, and in some cases, inflammation was. In other cases, it was very complicated. But other things take uh, a lot more change than uh, th th and to be able to see the progress in a nine-month period or so is, is obviously limited. We had three individuals that had excessively high mercury. Uh, two of them were because they ate too much tuna sushi. And when they gave tuna sushi up, their mercury levels came quickly back to normal and so forth. The third one had amalgams, old-fashioned amalgams, and they replaced the amalgams. And again, that started to reverse the whole process. But these are things you can say, well, gee, why doesn't your physician pick those up? And two of them had their own personalized physicians in special programs, and they miss these things. So that says something about what healthcare does for you. So here is an absolutely incredible figure. We've now shown that there are more than 35,000 correlation between individual data types in one of these five types of data with data types in other uh, types of data. And each of those correlations could say something about biology, something about actionable possibilities, and or uh, both possibilities. But they give us a picture, the likes of which we've never had before, that begins to correlate network biology in really interesting ways. And I'll say more about that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, wellness to disease transition. We had uh, several individuals that uh, genetics demonstrated were homozygous for the gene defect that leads to hemochromatosis. And what's complicated about hemochromatosis is only about um, 30% of the individuals actually get the disease. So once you've done the genetic diagnosis, you need an environmental assay to confirm that. So uh, they had high ferritin levels, high levels of iron. And in fact, one of the individuals already was having the first signs of hemochromatosis, which is uh, arthritic degeneration. He was a hiker and was having trouble hiking. And all you have to do to cure this is to have regular blood draws until your level comes back to normal. And over a six-month period, he's already reversed the arthritis and is, uh, is back as a normal uh, individual. I think what's interesting is we had 12 individuals that are uh, heterozygote. So this is the most common genetic disease in Caucasians, just for those who don't know. Uh, and look, their iron level is halfway between normal and, and the diseased, and the question is whether that level is damaging or not. And so the, there are N of 1 experiments that we can do to test that uh, particular hypothesis. We can use the blood tests with regard to proteomics or with regard to metabolomics to make interesting kinds of uh, correlations. And in this one, we used activity as measured by Fitbit steps uh, to correlate with cardiac-related proteins. And what you can say is there are sets of proteins that increase as activity increases. There are sets of proteins that uh, uh, increase as activity decreases. And what's interesting about these is they begin to map into networks, and you see that there are nodal points in those networks you hadn't realized were a part of those networks, or at least were a part of interrelated kind of networks. So this gives us a really global ability to begin looking at physiology and 
really interesting ways using the kind of uh, maps, uh, uh, biological networks that you're also uh, familiar with and everything. And I think one of the most striking things that we determined was that we could actually begin to map out genetic risk for individuals for uh, the diseases that had been studied appropriately with genome-wide association uh, uh, studies. Uh, and this is now, it's now about 70 different diseases, actually. And to give you an example of what a GWAS study is, this study had almost 200,000 individuals. One was a discovery set, and the other half was a validation set. And they identified 72 loci that control cholesterol levels. And of course, you had some that uh, decreased cholesterol. That's the green or good. And you had some that increased it, and that was the red or the bad. And what's interesting is we can aggregate for each individual, because we have the complete genome sequence, the genetic risk for this particular trait. And we can map them from individuals that are uh, high risk to individuals that are low risk. And what is interesting, and this is a family but for this uh, single individual, is the beautiful correlation between the genotype and the phenotype, that is the disease propensity and the phenotype that is correlated with that uh, propensity. So this is HDL, this is the good uh, lipid, and again, low risk people obviously have higher levels than, than do the high risk. Here is the uh, LDL, the bad lipid, and again, it's high for the high risk and it's low for the low-risk individuals. This trait is controlled genetically much more tightly than this trait, and that actually had been known. But what is really striking is why is this individual up there far away from, in a sense, his real genetic potential? It turns out he's a triathlon uh, athlete that's in utterly superb shape, so not completely surprising. But what is more questionable is why is this individual underperforming? And what's really interesting about that individual is he has levels that are the same as these individuals that are in the very high risk case. Yet we would treat these people with drugs. We would almost certainly treat this person, at least initially, with environmental kinds of things. So you need both types of data to be able to make assessments about what you're to do. The integration of data is really critical. And I'll give you just one slice of data on the gut microbiome. So here are the uh, 107 individuals. And you can see they have more or less a continuous distribution of differing ratios of the uh, major uh, microbes that live in, in their gut and so forth. But what was really interesting is there are two of these microbes that are linked to excessive inflammation uh, and often come up with recent antibiotic treatment. So what we did is we binned all of the individuals uh, with regard to their genetic risk for Crohn's disease that had 91 variants, and you can see the distribution that we have here. And then we looked at the gut microbiome distributions, and what you can see is those two pro-inflammatory creatures uh, expanded as the risk got higher and higher. Again, there was a correlation between genotype and phenotype in this particular thing. And of course, we had one individual that had been diagnosed with Crohn's disease that fell in this particular category. And of course, one of the things one can think about doing is using probiotics, prebiotics, to actually change the distribution of these uh, pathogenic, uh, supposedly pathogenic bacteria and so forth. But again, it's the second instance where genotype correlates with phenotype. So here's a list, partial list, of some of the GWAS uh, governed traits, diseases, and so forth. And many, you can see, are uh, not really actionable. Some are physiologic responses. But I'll just point out that we've got some interesting uh, markers here for Alzheimer's disease. So what we actually can do now, because we have more than 2,000, quote, normal genomes, 
is we can carry out the GWAS studies for each of those 50 diseases on these 2,000 individuals, and we can create models for high quality analysis in which we get, often we get kind of these uh, bell-shaped distributions, and we can map the individual pioneers as to whether they're uh, at high risk or above average or below average or at very low risk. So it gives the metric of disease predisposition a reality of where they reside in a similar kind of uh, population. And so what we're planning to do then is to uh, uh, keep track of most of these diseases in the future. And where they aren't actionable, we will wait until they become actionable, and then we'll tell the individuals that they should go see their physician and be checked up for what can be done for uh, Alzheimer's if, if that's what they have. So um, here are the distributions of the uh, 2,000 normal genomes for the Crohn's disease, for obesity, for this is late onset Alzheimer's. There are 44 such markers. Really has an interesting bimodal distribution. I have no idea what that is. And, and psoriasis has this enormously interesting shoulder there. And again, we don't really know what that is. But what we're planning to do is for Alzheimer's, there are three classes of markers. There are 230 GWAS markers, and then there are another 44 for late onset, and then there are the APOE4 alleles. And what we've done with the pioneers is analyze them for the APOE4 alleles, and we have two that are homozygous for the bad allele and 22 that are heterozygous. And the risk is considerable. If you're a homozygous for APOE4, you have between a 65 and 70% chance of Alzheimer's by the time you're 65. If you're a heterozygote, you've got a 12% chance at that level. So what we can say is roughly 20% of the pioneers fall in a relatively high-risk group for Alzheimer's. So what we're going to be doing is taking one to 200 high-risk Alzheimer's individuals, and we're going to actually do the same long-term high-dimensional analyses, but we're going to be uh, using many more brain-specific blood proteins that can see the changes in the brain very early on. And then when we see the earliest transition, there is a collaborator we have at UCLA who claims with therapy, exercise, diet, and supplements, if you get him people at the earliest transitions, he can delay the onset anywhere between 5 and 15 years for Alzheimer's. So if any of you are at high risk, it would be well worth uh, looking into that possibility. OK. so. We have calculated 35,000 statistically significant correlations in these individuals, and it's just a panoply of possibilities for the future. We've demonstrated that the genome risk, genetic risk for diseases, correlates beautifully with the phenotype that measures susceptibility to those diseases, and that's for a whole bunch of things that we didn't talk about as well. And then finally, we can begin next generation, early stage, look at biomarkers and map them into networks and activities and so forth for the future. So every one of the 107 pioneers had multiple actionable traits. These are well people, uh, but all of them optimized their, uh, their wellness. Uh, I would say many of them came to the conclusion the genome doesn't control the destiny, rather just your potential, and you can change it for many genome-related kinds of activities. Uh, but I think the most profound observation was I can really take control of my health with the proper data, and I think that's really the key, one of the keys to decreasing the cost of health care in the future. And almost all the pioneers want to continue the longitudinal study into its next phase, and I'll 
I'll talk about it in just a minute in its next phase. This is one of the most complicated scientific projects we've ever done, and it was a whole team that put this together, and uh, it, it really, I think, was absolutely a wonderful effort. We're writing up a cell paper now with uh, all the data, some of which I've shown you here. So how is it going to transform healthcare? We're going to identify a vast array of actionable possibilities. We already have in excess of 100, and these are only going to increase with time. We can optimize wellness and avoid disease by studying the individual, uh, analyzing the individual data clouds. We're beginning to get the metrics that will give us I think the ability not only to measure wellness, but to deconvolute it into its physiologic and its psychological components as well. Uh, we're going to see disease transitions for all of the common diseases. Uh, we're going to think about old assays, improving them, and uh, developing new assays, particularly immunologic assays. We don't have a sufficient number yet. But you know, the ideal thing would be in a 10-year period to be able to take a droplet of blood and put it in your smartphone and have most of the data we need that could be uh, uh, sent directly to an analytic uh, platform. Uh, we're going to create databases of both wellness and disease transitions, and that's going to catalyze the wellness industry. And I think it's going to bring P4 medicine into the healthcare system. And, will improve quality, will reduce cost, and, and certainly promote uh, innovation. But I think it's going to have broader context with regard to society. We're going to see a digitalization of medicine for the individual patient. And ultimately, the digitalization of medicine will lead to the same thing the digitalization of communication did. Namely, it'll be extended to uh, the underdeveloped worlds and people there can take advantage of it as well as, uh, as, as we in the developed worlds. Uh, innovation, I've already spoken about. Wealth, again, I think this wellness industry is going to be an enormous growth industry and we're uh, at a, uh, a terrific tipping point to create the companies that will fuel this, uh, this whole new industry. On the competition, uh, if, you, if you think about uh, the Industrial Revolution, what in some sense really drove that was the invention of the steam engine. Now, the steam engine is a macro invention which threw off a gazillion micro inventions, and that fueled the uh, Industrial Revolution. And I think P4 is going to be, in a sense, a macro invention that will spawn many micro-inventions here in the, in the wellness space and so forth. The uh, financial crisis for healthcare, I think the key is one, individuals taking responsibility for their own health, and two, I think the fact that if we can convert people very early on in the disease transition back to wellness, we can save, uh, we can save society enormous amounts of money. And again, uh, the optimization of human capital. You know, trillions of dollars are lost worldwide in people being sick. And 20% of the people that are sick stay home and go to bed. But about 80% are called presenteeism. That is, they go to work and they do absolutely nothing. So if one could really cut that back, you could obviously save a lot. How are we going to scale up? We've started with 100. We're thinking this next year, 18 months of going to 10,000, and then 50, and then 100,000. And the, the project will really have two directions. One is uh, an academic direction where we're going to pioneer this 100-person wellness project along two lines. One, we'd like to continue the wellness studies. But two, we'd like to engage populations that are susceptible to diseases so we can see early on the transitions as with the Alzheimer's example I gave you. And finally, we're going, we have created a company, Wellness Sciences, that is going directly to the consumer. And we think it's really going to be the lead in large-scale 
uh, adoption of P4 medicine, and democratization of healthcare. And I'll just close by saying if we really succeed in getting the system to accept this and to, with the digitalization of medicine, I think it will lead to the possibility of being able to bring this kind of medicine to the developing as well as the developed world and to a democratization that was unimaginable even, uh, even five years ago. So that's it. I'll be glad to answer questions. And Thank you very much, Lee, for a fascinating talk, as always. Uh, we can maybe have uh, 20 minutes or so uh, Q&A. Any questions we will have uh, for Lee? Um, so have you looked at the blood of uh, the biomarkers of vegetarians and vegans versus non-vegetarians and seen if they have, let's say, increases in advanced glycation end products or carbonylated proteins and if those can be fixed with, let's say, taurine supplementation or carnosine or creatine, creatine? So what we have done is shown from the gut microbiome, we can tell an enormous amount about your diet. And from the metabolome, we can tell quite a bit about your diet as well. So we, we haven't looked specifically at vegans and things like that, but we have the potential uh, to do all of that kind of thing. I mean, and it's funny, I mean, one of the advice, one of the actionable possibilities is for individuals with nutrient difficulties is increasing vegetables of certain types and so forth. And, you can tell whether they followed their actionable possibilities or not. They can. Just like smoking. I mean, it's utterly crystal clear. Even if you smoke rarely, you, you have, we can see those uh, metabolites beautifully. So we will be able to sort out all sorts of things. And uh, we're, we're just beginning to make the correlations now. But it's a very exciting area. Lee, uh, tour de force as usual. Uh, you know, it's uh, actually ironic that in this last week, I don't know if you followed uh, this brouhaha that Forbes magazine had about Mark Cuban, uh, who had the audacity to say that he was going to track his blood every quarter with a tiny fraction of the test that the pioneers did. And it was like this complete avalanche for the medical community that this was going to destroy healthcare, this was going to bankrupt the system, this was completely unethical to ask people to do. Um, it sounds like an op-ed opportunity for you, but this is a national controversy. It came from a tweet that Cuban sent off. Um, you know, owns the Mavericks, and and so it's a rich person can obviously afford it. But most of this was saying that there's this belief in the medical industry that. Uh, doing time series is somehow evil and uh, costly with no benefit. And it's so deeply rooted in, 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 in the entire establishment, which this little brouhaha this last week uh, in the popular press brought out. Um, do you have anything to say about this? Because it's, it's, sure. it's a huge, it's, it reminded me of the start of your talk um, with how the biologist responded when you had the audacity to say that you could actually sequence the genome of a human being and they all said that's uh, gonna be horrible yep. and shouldn't be done. Yep, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I have followed that and in fact, our first collaborator on the 100K project is a wonderful scientist from Finland who actually is going to take uh, 150 pioneers and do an 18-month study on them. And he's going to do almost the same things that we did. We've, we've uh, harmonized the assays. But he wrote to me a week ago and said, look, everything's ready to go. I can't get the IRB committee to approve this. And here's a list of the issues that they've raised. And they're exactly the kind of things that came up. So I've already written that letter, so I guess it could be <laughs> modified slightly for Forbes. But um, 
that w I think what is really compelling is we just gave them the statistics on how people uh, were improved and how it was actionable and how, I mean, I think the most important statistic is essentially everyone wants to go into the next study. They're, they're voting with their feet. So it's, it is, you know, anytime I go speak at a medical school, I have these guys rising up uh, in ig indignant kind of, who do you think you are changing medicine? And, you, you're, and it's the same thing. You cost them a lot of money, and you give them no benefit. And of course, the easy thing is to say, well, how do you know? You don't do it, right? And then I can give the examples of where concierge physicians time and time again have failed to pick up simple things like hemochromatosis. This, you know, they'd been working on his arthritis for a year, and they'd made no progress whatsoever. So, and you can tell your story about Crohn's disease too, which it, going to physician after physician who said, oh, don't worry about these inflammatory markers. Come back when you're sick. <laughs> yes, yeah, so. Hi, thank you for an interesting talk. I'd like to ask you, I haven't heard anything about imaging and my job is imaging, so mm -hmm. I want to make sure you don't put me out of business. Uh, <laughs> PET, SPECT, ultrasound, where does this fit in? And if it doesn't right now, what can we do to aid in what you're doing? Look, I, th I think imaging is, is wonderful complex phenotyping. I think it could add enormously to what we can do. We can't afford it. That's, I mean, that's the big criteria. So we're really hoping we can bring in imaging if, for example, we put into this President Obama's initia on, initiative on precision medicine, maybe we can get the money to do some of the assays that were just kind of out of our price range. We had to, we had to do rock bottom things because I went to Francis Collins uh, about six months ago told him about this and said, look, can you help us really get started on this? And he said, unequivocally, wouldn't put a penny into it. He'd been cut back, and other people were waiting. And who did I think I was trying to get a new program in? So we had this program basically funded by philanthropy, or we'd be still waiting to start it, frankly. So, so the, the big constraint is cost. And I think imaging is terrific. So I'm, I'm on your side completely, if we can only figure out how to make it affordable. Okay. Um, so one, uh, one interesting thing is that um, sleep quality, as measured in percent of time spent in slow waves and deeper stages of sleep, often declines with age starting in one's late 20s. And one thing is that a lot of people have subclinical levels of sleep apnea that just become more prevalent. And my question is, have you thought about maybe measuring sleep quality in those studies and seeing if those can respond to interventions? So we did. And we initially were going to do it with the Fitbit. You're supposed to be able to tap your Fitbit when you go to bed, and it'll keep track of basically your activity, which is inversely proportional to the quality of your sleep. But we found that most people didn't put it in the night mode, so we didn't get very useful data. What I think would really be incredible would be to get an app that could measure respiration. Because that really, see, I think sleep apnea is really an important area, and if, we could just measure respiration. We could easily do, uh, we could easily do um, uh, uh, sleep apnea and, and so forth. Uh, the quality of sleep is another thing. There was uh, an app for doing that called, what, Ceno or something like this, but it went out, of, what? Yeah, it went out of business. And it was actually pretty good. It did a pretty good job. So. I think we need to get better uh, devices that people are willing to use uh, in the context of these studies. Uh, so my question is, uh, 
have you already done or maybe are you considering uh, developing or measuring this sort of uh, dynamic markers like we've heard in uh, some of the talks, uh, maybe like sampling, not like once in three months, but you know, sampling like every day or even like with the interval of a few hours or maybe giving a person a perturbation, like you know, drink a, a can of Coke and then see how your blood sure. sugar goes up or down. So I think both of those would be great. I mean, look, sampling every three months is really undersampling. There's no question for a lot of things we'd be interested in. We have thought of putting together a study for six men and six women where we'd study them for a week and take four measurements over the course of each day, early uh, to late, to be able to look at uh, circadian rhythm kind of things and, and disruptions of circadian rhythm and so forth. But um, what would really be great for doing that is to have a device, a microfluidic device, where you could make a few thousand measurements from a, just a drop of blood so you didn't have to stick a needle in their arm and, and take blood out for the, uh, for the things that we'd like to measure. And that's, that's going to be available, I think, in, within a five-year period. I mean, Jim Heath talked about some things that are beginning to, uh, to move in that direction and everything. So, so I, th I, think, I think that really is an important thing to do. And I think dynamics in all dimensions are really going to be important to do. Uh, let's get one more here, and then we'll come back to you. It's, it's actually very related to the previous one. So, for example, yesterday we heard about heart rate variability as something that you can measure and essentially reflect um, an organ network or blood uh, chemistry, maybe. So the question is, do you think that we will be able to use phenotypic traits uh, or that we can monitor easily through our apps, mobiles, or bio sensors, and uh, essentially use those continuous data instead of sampling blood? Or sure, sure. So I mean, you know, the Apple Watch, for example, at least lets you take, keep track of your pulse and things like that. And I don't know, maybe it could be engineered to do heart rate variability. I think. I think heart rate variability is absolutely a fascinating parameter. I think all parameters that measure the confluence of multiple systems are fascinating parameters. And of course, heart rate variability is, is integrating the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems and how they behave and everything. So I think really consciously searching for other parameters like heart rate variability would that that integrate different physiologies would really be great. Okay, so uh, I have a question. Um, have you ever thought about a collaboration with George Church's Personal Genome Project or the also the Open Humans Project that's brought out of some people within that group? So we have talked to George a lot about, um, we have very similar philosophies except in one very fundamental way. We, in this initial study, operated under an IRB, and we couldn't reveal who was in the study, nor did we have any right to make that data available to anybody but uh, the individual person themselves. As you know, George requires, when people go into his study, that they make public absolutely all their medical data. And so we, we're, we just can't do that at this particular stage. But in principle, I really like the idea of having as much data public as possible. I think it's, it's really key for inventing the future of predictive medicine. So uh, personally, I don't necessarily want to live longer, but I just want to live in perfect health until about the day before I die. I agree with you completely. <laughs> so if you can figure that yeah. one out, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would love to figure that one out. Yeah. Um, so, so I have a question about the coaches. Um, so what did the coaches do? I mean, that to me seems like an area where it might be hard to scale up. And so how involved were they? How much did people utilize them? What happens if you don't? 
connect with your coach? How do you envision that more personal element fitting into the well, larger Well, let me program? just say that we hired several coaches from uh, a tobacco succession company that handled millions of patients a year and did it very effectively. And they were really trained in, on the one hand, kind of psychologic theory and how you persuade people to do things in their own interest. And on the other hand, they were both really experienced in uh, nutrition and a whole bunch of other things. So they're really, they're really knowledgeable people. In fact, they did a lot of the literature survey that, uh, I mean, we have a database now that has 240,000 nodes and 5 million edges that are all, all that kind of information and everything. So they were knowledgeable there, but really important. They, and their philosophy was with each individual, you figured out what they really wanted in terms of health. And you know, people will say, well, I want way less. That's nonsense because what, what you want is, I'd like to be able to walk up a mountain path with my grandkids or a photographer that was way overweight. I'd like to be able to go on a hike in the Grand Canyon so I can take beautiful pictures. And then you relate the actionable possibilities back to their real desires. So they, they had a call about once a month. And I think people were very, very good at, uh, and, and the coach uh, was unbelievably engaging. And she probably, if you asked the 107, what stood out most in this study, I think they would say the coach for sure stood out in the study. And she did. She was really, uh, do you want to say anything about her, Larry? Uh, no, Sandy was absolutely one of the most shockingly, pleasantly surprising parts of this whole study. Uh, I've dealt with people who are in her line of work, as they say, uh, for years, many years. She was better than anyone that I'd ever uh, engaged. And it wasn't just, um, it was her attitude and how she thought about converting the data into things that were actionable, and then very personable ability to deal with people who, by and large, you know, all of us are in denial about any particular thing that's wrong with us, and to deal with that and still get you to do one thing. And by the way, these were half hour calls, so in terms of scaling, she was doing <clears throat> you know, roughly 100 um, of these calls per quarter. Um, uh, but also very knowledgeable, uh, and not an MD, I believe. I mean, She's not an MD, yeah. no. Uh, which I think is, a, is another incredibly important point that we are underutilizing a large fraction of people like her who aren't MDs, but who are actually vastly more valuable to their patients than the MDs are. Uh, and, and that, I think, is also part of the transformation you're talking about. Uh, is to get these sort of things. I mean, just think of pharmacists at, 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 at you know, CVS and all the other stores. Um, many of them have plenty of training to be able to interpret things like that. That's where, in principle, like Walgreens is working with Elizabeth Holmes to get ther Theranos, uh, all these medical tests from just a drop of blood out into the Walgreens stores. Well, who are you going to talk to once you get your response back? And it, the pharmacist could yeah. do 90% of it. But the way it's set up now, that won't happen uh, without some major changing. So I think there's a whole, in terms of scaling, it's a whole set of our population that is well-trained and ready to go. But for regulatory reasons, guild protection of the doctors and other things are not being utilized. And these uh, tests and these correlations that you pointed out, um, and I got to say, as somebody in the program, uh, it's amazing how much work you've done since uh, the close of the program and analyzing this stuff that we didn't know about, that we want to know more about, yeah. uh, it's a tremendously exciting. So, so uh, 
I've gone to several deans of nursing schools trying to say they ought to have a special track for coaches. And I think several are really interested. And they'd be ideal kind of candidates and everything. Um, with regard to scaling, um, Sandy thinks she could handle two to 300 individuals. So you'd need three to four per thousand uh, individuals that you brought on board and everything. And we think that scales. And, and we're willing to, uh, and it, it's not all that expensive. The coaching as a part of the expense for a year now is about $343. Uh, that gives you that gives you the coach. So it's it's I mean the thing that really costs are the assays. They're just killers. And the thing that's really bad is a complete genome sequence, which is still, you know, 1,200, 1,300, 1,400, depending on who you talk to. That's why I spoke about the hundred dollar genome. That'll really change things. So okay. Uh, uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, my question is in the social as aspect. So I was like picturing, so after your talk, I was picturing uh, like in the future, someday I got text that after uh, the inspection, you are like 70 percentage to get this kind of disease in the next 10 years. So is that like, uh, to me, like I feel like I, I probably would be very scared or frustrated. Uh, I thought I would be healthy, but turns out I have certain percentage to get certain sure. diseases. Sure. But is it like more like I, so like how to dealing with the relationship, with, I mean between these kind of potential patients because, because they might get easily frustrated and they might, I mean, get, get depressed and this probably will lead even uh, even worse situation because they might very likely to get this, I mean, this disease because of their, their wound. Yeah, so I would say two things about that. One, we essentially are not giving back to the individuals anything that's non-actionable, except for four diseases where they had an opt-in or opt-out, and it included APOE4, it included BRCA1, some of those kind of things. What we will say is almost everyone opted in, and I think everyone felt totally fine about it and accepted whatever it was. So that's, that's uh, so the really important thing is we don't give non-actionable things out because, I mean, where do you go with them? You know, what do you do with them? So, uh, but we are going to keep track of them. So when they become actionable, we can go to you and say, OK, it's time to go see your doctor about this disease, and he'll tell you what you can do about it. So that way, you don't have to worry about being depressed about what's to come. So um, how do we uh, opt into the next scale up? <laughs> You know, I, I was given a gazillion cards. So um, we have a website here that you can write to. I was going to stick that on my last slide. And you can get registered. We've got about five or 600 people. And in the next 18 months, we're going to do 10,000. So there is uh, some room. Th there are some logistics. It's it's better if you're clustered in groups because the one thing that's really hard that has been a hassle is blood drawing. And we get it done by Quest, which has it almost every place, but it, it's still a big hassle to get all the different Quest places because what happens is they have to draw multiple tubes, they have to prepare them multiple ways, they have to send them to multiple vendors. So it's a, it's a logistics hassle. But if, if you are interested, um, is there anyone here in the program? We, it, the site is 100k.systemsbiology.net. OK. Just, do you have cards or anything you can hand out? Uh, 
Uh, no, that's, that's the address that, that, uh, for the site. We why, can don't we pull write it it, why don't we write it on the board for those that are visual rather than auditory learners? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so I know that you said that, that the 107 people mostly kept their data to, the, uh, to themselves uh, because it's, it's not like your church's product in the way. I'm just curious, out of those 107, were there any volunteers who, out of them who pretty much put, put all their data online? That was not a question we could ask because of the IRB. So we can't answer that question. Okay. The IRB specified very precisely how we treat it, the, the nature of the rules for privacy. And, and it was, they, they're pretty absolute. And Larry, uh, if you were willing to go public, then you could talk about it and we could talk about you. But most people didn't go public. We had four or five that went public on it. 